So at this point, I could go on to talk about the effectiveness of vocational programs. And the reason I want to do this is I want to make the point that when I first did this work, I would have loved to, to see the data that we now have available to us on the effect of working directly on people with schizophrenia and what kind of changes it can make in their, uh, in their symptoms and their functioning. But when I was uh, originally doing this work, uh, work rehabilitation essentially didn't work. It wasn't effective, and there was no effect on long-term employment all from vocational rehabilitation until the 1970s. Then we started to do a bit better, but there was no improvement in competitive employment, which means getting a regular job in the mainstream workforce, until the introduction of supported employment in the 1990s. Now we have supported employment, which we can talk a bit about if we like, and we see that all of the reviews or meta-analyses of supported employment versus a standard vocational rehab, in this case by a British researcher who did this analysis, shows that supported employment results in many more people with serious mental illness working. And the most recent review by Bond of studies of uh, individual placement and support, which is a, a subset of supported employment, shows, again, dramatically better rates of employment for people who receive that intervention compared to control groups. And so what that allows us to look at suddenly is that back then, you couldn't say, well, how, how would you do a study of work on people with schizophrenia? You couldn't say, we'll give these people work, but we won't give these people work because that wouldn't have been ethical. But now at least you can say, we're going to do a study of supported employment. We'll study the outcomes, not just in terms of um, whether the person is employed or not, but also on the person's symptoms and functioning. And what we find if we look at these non-vocational outcomes of vocational rehabilitation since 1990, which essentially is supported employment, we find that those who receive the effective vocational rehabilitation uh, achieve a reduction in hospital admission, a reduction in the cost of treatment largely because of the reduction in hospital admission, a reduction in positive and negative symptoms of psychosis, which essentially means work helps people with schizophrenia recover, improvements in quality of life, which uh, often means uh, functioning and, uh, and independent living, increase in self-esteem, improvements in functioning, and social network expansion. So for me, you know, having been looking at this field for uh, 20 or 30 years now, these are some of the most exciting findings in the literature because really this is just a statement that work helps people recover from psychosis. And recognize that these studies generally only conducted for 6 to 18 months, really longer than that because of the nature of research funding. And if one were to continue these studies for a longer period of time, you might see much more dramatic effect on the course of the illness because what do you expect to see in the first 6 to 18 months anyway? So we may only be just looking at the tip of the iceberg. So, so what's the situation for people with serious mental illness now? If you ask people with serious mental illness, do you want to work? 60 to 70 percent say, yes, I would like to. Um, we know, and I'll enlarge on this a little bit shortly, that 50 to 60 percent can be competitively employed. We know that because we've been looking at the supported employment outcomes, and we know that if you have effective vocational rehabilitation, that proportion of people can end up working depending on the disincentives in the, in the uh, disability pension system. However, in the States, fewer than 25% actually receive vocational services and routinely 15% or 15 to 20% in Britain, in Australia, in the United States ever are employed at any point in time. So, you know, we're really not doing what we need to, and it's important for us to do better if we want people to have a better outcome. So this is just to show you that people with serious mental illness, in this case schizophrenia, 50% of them can be employed. This is a study which I did some years ago, 96, comparing outcome for people with schizophrenia in Boulder and in Bologna in Italy. Uh, employed for the, for the prior three months or longer, 50% in Italy where the disincentives are very low, 
and only 30% in Boulder where we had a very strong vocational rehabilitation program. And a similar kind of difference for employed full time, 30 or more hours a week, substantially more in Italy than in the United States. So the, the fundamental point is here that unemployment is not a feature of schizophrenia. Unemployment for people with schizophrenia is a feature of the economic system. And so we have to sort of shake off the negativism that we might have about what people with schizophrenia can do and think about how we can smooth the road so that they can do what they can do. Uh, so what we're looking at here is here are different kinds of work opportunities that present themselves to people with mental illness. There's a sheltered workshop, which is kind of an old-fashioned model, a lot of them being converted now into social firms, and social firms I'll be talking about are firms that are set up with a dual mission of employing people with a disability and having a useful product or service that is, uh, comes out of the business. Then there's supported employment, which I'll be talking about, traditional voc vocational rehabilitation, where, which I'll talk about the, the uh, train and place model, and then independent employment, where you just go out and get a job. So we look at these, uh, glancingly, traditional vocational rehabilitation, where you, you go to the vocational rehabilitation office, and you get counseling, and you get some training, and you get placed in a job, and then they walk away and leave you doing the job and expect and say, that's, we've closed that case, that was a successful case, and they don't know if you're still employed two weeks later. That's the traditional model. There are a few psychiatric rehabilitation staff usually in those offices in the United States. And when the US accounting office reviewed vocational rehabilitation across the country, it's a mixture of federal and state money, few clients with mental illness ever received services through them, and those who did get services earned less afterwards than they did before. <laughs> so the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, which is the advocacy group, claimed that that half a million dollars spent a year was wasted quite reasonably. Now supported employment, which is the innovation that came in in the 90s, is very different. The staff locate jobs in community businesses. So you, you go out and you, maybe you've got a client who's interested in working with dogs. You go to somebody who has a doggy daycare. You say, would you be willing to employ our client who's this nice chap and he likes working with dogs? Uh, and uh, what we offer that we'll do for you, employer, is we'll select the person, obviously, that we're going to place there. And we ourselves will learn how to do the doggy daycare job. And we will train the, the patient to be able to do that job. We may paint chain two so that uh, if uh, the first patient can't come on Tuesday because he's, he's not feeling well, then the second person can come. Uh, so they may have job sharing going on. And so uh, you place and support the client after the person's been placed. You support them and you've trained them yourself that uh, the job coach has. And then you find somebody else to do the job when the client is incapacitated, which amazingly at times can be the job coach himself or herself, which uh, you know, a lot of, lot of people laugh at when they first hear it, and it probably doesn't happen that often, but theoretically it does happen that people, the, the job coach will go in and do the job himself. So for the employer, it's a great deal because you've got these entry-level jobs that are high turnover. You're putting a lot of money into hiring and training, and as soon as you turn that job into a support employment position, you never have to do that again because the hiring and the training is done for you by the uh, job coach and the supported employment business. So the work, work supports can, can, can continue indefinitely. They're gradually reduced, but you, know, you can, can increase them when problems develop. And so it's continuously support, continuous supported employment was the original term for this model. So very different from the train and place model. Now, the way these teams are often set up is you, you need enough full-time staff working on this that they can support one another. So although you want to have the program very closely integrated with the service, the, the, the treatment service, so there's a lot of flow of information backs and forwards, you don't want to leave that vocational worker, just one, stranded on an assertive community treatment team because what will happen is they'll get sucked off their vocational work and plugged into treatment work. So you need to have a big enough uh, uh, cohort of 
a vocational staff that they can devote themselves exclusively to their vocational task. Full-time supervisor also provides employment services, so there's a supervisor on the team. Um, the support employment team is located in the mental health center, <coughs> so it has to be closely uh, integrated for it to be effective. Caseloads are about 20 for each of these job coaches, and 50% of the time is spent in the community. Uh, training the, pers the person who's been placed, meeting them, working things about problems with the employer, out there looking for jobs, talking to employers. And what they'll do often is they'll throw an employer's banquet uh, once a year. Certainly in Boulder we used to do that. And the employers who are employing people come along and the people who are being employed come along. You've got this room full of people who are all helping one another out. And the, the reinforcement of the social mission of the employers is a tremendous addition to the effect of the work and they're holding employers in the group uh, because they get to see themselves as contributing to society as the years go by. Now, individual placement and support is kind of the latest update of that. That's what you were seeing, the six European studies <coughs> being conducted adhering to these principles. Uh, the, these are important principles. Eligibility is placed is based on consumer choice. So. You ask the person with the illness, what would you like to do? I would like an outdoor job, please, and I like animals, so you get the doggy daycare. Or I want an indoor job, and, you know, I, I got a degree in sociology, so you'd look for something that uh, fits better for that person. It might be working within a mental health center as a treatment provider of some kind or a service provider. Uh, vocational service integrated with treatment. We talked about that. Competitive employment is the goal. They insist on competitive employment, and they, they argue that other kinds of employment, such as in social firms, for example, or in a workshop, um, is not acceptable. I, I'm more uh, eclectic than that. I think any kind of employment is okay, and if you've got some people who function incredibly slowly and you've got a sheltered a workshop, it's okay for those people who really need it to be employed in the sheltered workshop. In fact, it has a place, I think, in the system, but I, I won't hammer that point too, home too heavily. Rapid job search is important, that instead of hanging around for three months training somebody, so well, let's see how you do on this setting, let's see how you are on sweeping the porch, okay, let's see how you are on being reliable and coming to this. Uh, instead, the person gets placed in the job very early on and supported. And, and in fact, outcome results are better with rapid job search. There is evidence for all of these findings. Job finding is based on consumer preference. So that's really the point I was making up here. The, the important point about eligibility is placed on consumer choice really is that you don't exclude people who, for example, are substance abusers because you're a substance abuser. Because in fact, when you place sub someone who's got a mental illness and substance abuse in a job, their substance abuse improves because work reinforces sobriety. Continuous time unlimited support and benefit. Benefits planning is provided, so it's important to make sure the person understands how many hours they can work. Often people have to go into the employer and say, thank you for offering me uh, $10 an hour for this job, but I'd rather you paid me eight because then uh, I can work the number of hours I want to work and not lose my SSDI. That happens all the time.